thank you guys for having me and for sticking around. Um, <clears throat> as I was uh, enjoying the previous two talks, which were great, uh, I realized that there is actually a thread. Uh, one, Geoffrey was talking about this super linear growth of all kinds of things with uh, the scale of our social networks. And you mentioned also crime. And I would add abuse of social networks themselves. So as <clears throat> um, Facebook and Twitter are becoming our ubiquitous way to communicate among each other and to access information, they're also becoming targets of abuse. And so that's uh, what I'm going to talk about. But <clears throat> I also want to talk, when, when we see the abuse, it, usually the goal is to promote something, like some fake news or some misinformation. And so we have to measure how successful these attacks are. And so we are measuring the success of fake news. So there is a connection, uh, connection there. So uh, we are all familiar now with the uh, ubiquity of a lot of junk out there. Uh, here is one example, uh, one fake news that went particularly viral around the time of the 2016 elections in the United States. This is an article that appeared on Infowars. Infowars is one of the major conspiracy theory uh, websites that <clears throat> spread lots of misinformation. And this one in particular had to do with uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign basically having doing witchcraft. And uh, it's actually connected, it's in, it's in the same cat, it's connected to other things that you probably have heard about, like the Pizzagate scandal. Uh, both things came from these hacked emails and just basically took completely innocent emails, like let's go have pizza, and then started saying, well, pizza is really code for child pornography and witchcraft, and, and so we saw these kinds of things. And uh, well, that would be harmless and perhaps even funny if it wasn't for the fact that this news like this have spread virally. This one was retweeted 30,000 times on Twitter that we know of. And uh, this is just a part of the spreading network for just this one particular article. Um, because I couldn't quite uh, visualize the whole network, so <clears throat> this is sort of a part of the core. And um, we see some interesting things from a picture like this. Um, one is that, uh, of course, there are some nodes. By the way, in this, in this network, the nodes represent Twitter accounts. And the edges, which are a little bit hard to see, but you can see them, um, represent retweets. So if Kimo posts something and I retweet it, then that means that that particular thing has propagated from him to me. And so we draw an edge from his account to my account. So that's why this is what we call a diffusion network or a spread, <coughs> spreading network. And we uh, use the size of a node to represent the influence of that node in terms of how many times that uh, account is retweeted with a link to this particular article in this particular case. So you can see that there are some major players. Um, you know, like this big, I don't have a pointer, okay, these big nodes in the center. And those are, of course, accounts associated with the original source. And not necessarily. Some other accounts are really, really popular accounts that know nothing else than amplifying those messages. And they have lots and lots of followers and lots and lots of retweets. Um, the color of a node here represents um, the likelihood that that account is a bot, which is uh, computed with a tool that I'll tell you about later. So for now, take my word for it, yellow means that that account has been suspended or has gone inactive or has gone uh, private, which actually many bots do. Uh, it's one of the techniques that they use. They basically hide everything that they've ever posted and then maybe six months later reappear with a new uh, identity. Um, and the ones that are not yellow, they're on a scale between red and, and blue. Blue means more likely human, red means more likely bot. So for example, you will see some nodes down here which are kind of influential, maybe not quite as much as those two central nodes, but still quite influential. They get retweeted a lot, and they're very red. And so that's exactly the classic thing that you see bots do. They're like igniters, OK? Uh, they sort of get it out there. And then eventually, after a while, you know, lots of other people will start retweeting. But they make these things popular. And I'll show you that they make these things popular, especially in the early phases. 
and they're very successful. So I'll tell you more about um, how social bots can be used to manipulate social systems, and by extension, how our so online social systems can in general be abused and manipulated. But let me start with a little bit of history. We started studying this stuff a few years ago, back in 2010. Uh, it was before the 2010 midterm elections, and um, we had seen uh, an example uh, or some uh, examples of cases where some accounts that seemed kind of fishy were together promoting some, some memes, some hashtags, and, or some links, or some candidates, and um, making them popular, making politicians appear like they were very popular. So we started thinking, well, it seems pretty easy to do, it would seem that anybody could create a bunch of fake accounts and create the appearance that something is very popular. And this is now commonly referred to as AstroTurf because it's like fake grassroots, fake grassroots campaign. AstroTurf is like the synthetic uh, grass used in some courts. Uh, and, um, and so we started, uh, our intuition is that the structure of the diffusion network perhaps could tell us something about whether um, something that is popular is actually organic, natural, or is fake, astroturf. Um, so these are diffusion networks like the one I showed you before. The difference is that uh, <clears throat> we have two colors for edges. Blue here represents retweets, and orange represents mention. And mention is another way that things spread. For example, if I mention Roberta in a tweet, it, she will see it on her, on her um, screen. And so that, that is a way for me to communicate something to her. And we can infer that with some likelihood that meme has been transferred from me to her. So we also show in orange dimensions. Now, some things like the ones at the top look kind of organic. Uh, and these are people talking about various topics, including politics, which is why you see some kind of polarization and segregation there. And then we also saw some very suspicious things like the ones at the bottom. Um, so for example, uh, these two accounts here uh, are two accounts that looked very suspicious. They, they both had names, you know, female first name, underscore, last name, followed by a number, so kind of like pattern-like. And uh, one basically tweeted tens of thousands of messages, all promoting one candidate. Um, so again, those are all sort of typically suspicious patterns. First of all, the high volume. Second, the narrowness of, the, of what they were doing. And the other one would just automatically retweet the first. <laughs> and because we, in our visualization, we used the thickness of an edge in the network to represent the number of times the two accounts were retweeting each other. And so we saw this thing and we said, whoa, what is it? We thought it was a bug in our visualization code. And it wasn't. It was really like tens of thousands of retweets between these two accounts. And so that was one of the early examples that we, uh, that we found of bots that were um, causing, they were manipulating social media. In fact, the politician um, who was promoted um, be became very powerful. And um, I, I don't want to mention his name because I'm already in enough trouble as it is. So, <laughs> very powerful person. Um, and that was the year that this person sort of ascended uh, to power. Uh, here's another interesting example here. Um, so uh, the one, the, uh, it looks like a star. So the accounts at the outer edge, these are all accounts controlled by one person. This person had a fake news website. This was probably the first fake news website that we found out there in the wild. And posted articles either attacking some candidates or supporting other candidates. And they were all completely fabricated. And then these accounts would all post links to these fake uh, news articles, and they would also mention a person, and they would all do it in a very short time. So within, you know, like one hour, each of these accounts would mention one person, and that's the person in the middle. And that person was usually a very influential person, like a journalist or a politician. And sometimes that person would retweet, because they would think, oh, a lot of people are telling me that I should pay attention to this, and they would see the headline, and before checking it, they would just retweet it, and then there would be an avalanche, and then that tweet might, might reach thousands of people. Um, so that was, uh, that's another technique that we still observe today, uh, mentioning or replying to people in order to get something in front of them, to 
bring it to their attention. And this is now that being done systematically. So back then, we built a machine learning uh, classifier that was using various uh, features about the structure of this network, and in so doing was <laughs> capable of, with pretty good accuracy, discriminating between uh, AstroTurf and uh, organic stuff. Um, in the following year, since then, uh, all of a sudden, of course, the topic of abuse and manipulation and social bots have, has become sadly popular. So this was the cover of uh, the top magazine in computer science a few months ago. It was a, a, a review that we wrote about um, how social bots are becoming smarter and smarter. Now, I should say that social bots have lots of uh, applications, and they're not all bad. There are many good bots. For example, most major, uh, well, most uh, news organizations have bots that simply post uh, their articles. And bots are used for uh, doing all sorts of good things, from the trivial, like uh, you know, telling you what time it is or the weather, to, in some cases, spreading news about uh, rescue missions and, and responding, first res uh, helping first uh, coordination of first responders after disasters and so on. So there are lots of good bots. We're not arguing that all bots are bad. But we also see, and by the way, here, uh, the one at the top left is an example of a bot that was designed with completely good intention. It was designed by Microsoft to uh, showcase their AI technology. It was, a, it was an aut autonomous Twitter account that would have conversations with people and learn to interact with people as it goes. It was a really great project. Now, of course, a bunch of trolls got together on uh, 4chan or whatever and, and figured out how to uh, induce this bot into starting to tweet very racist uh, and very bad things. And so then Microsoft shut it down. Um, so, uh, here's a few other examples of how bots can be used to, for nefarious purposes. They can be used to manipulate the stock market. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> that example in the top middle was a penny stock, a worthless stock from a company that had gone bankrupt, I believe, uh, or was in bankruptcy. And then a bunch of bots started tweeting uh, the, uh, the ticker code. And then, of course, you, as you probably know, Investment companies also have their own bots that listen and uh, try to pick up chatter. And so these bots started automatically buying stocks. And so they were tricked by these other bots. And so before anybody noticed, this junk company was valued at $5 billion. And then a journalist noticed it. And then within a couple of days, the stock was uh, suspended. But in the meanwhile, somebody made a lot of money. Um, we've seen bots being used to suppress speech uh, during popular uprisings, and we've done some work on in Mex uh, with collaborators looking at this phenomenon in Mexico, where bots can just be used when a hashtag is used by people to communicate. You can just create uh, bots that flood that hashtag with junk so that people cannot use it anymore. And so that's an effective way to disrupt communication. Um, of course, now there is a lot of talk about fake followers. Um, a couple of days ago, there was a very interesting uh, article in the New York Times, in case you haven't seen it, that specifically looked at the market of fake followers and, and fake retweeters. Um, but even, you don't have to be a very smart bot to make money, right? So in this case, the bot, all they had to do is ping a mail, and they would get a credit card. Um, so you know, horny mails are not the most sophisticated bot detectors. Um, and of course. There has been a lot of talk about uh, Twitter maybe and uh, Twitter bots playing roles in the outcome of the elections. And I get asked this a lot. And my answer is, we have no idea. There is no way of knowing whether fake news and social bots had an effect on the outcome of the elections. And by that, I mean that there is no way to prove that they did, and there is no way to prove that they didn't, which to me is very scary. I, I, I would much prefer if I could answer, no, there's no way. And that's not true, because we see lots and lots of examples of, of um, fake news that are reshared by tens of thousands of people. And we know that the election was decided in some states with margins that were smaller than that. So if you assume that um, being exposed to some misinformation about a candidate uh, might perhaps increase the likelihood that you stay home instead of going to vote on that day, or maybe make you more likely to go to vote, um, 
you know, that would be, even if this effect was extremely small, that would be enough to turn an election in the United States. So, no, there's no way to prove it, and there's no way to disprove it. So, of course, we started uh, working more towards um, trying to see if we could automatically detect uh, these bots. So, we built a tool, initially it was called Bot or Not, and um, it, it used not only the structure of the network, but many other features uh, to try and come up with a, a statistical likelihood that an account looks more like automated accounts versus uh, normal human-driven accounts. And it was uh, recent, uh, decently accurate. So, for example, Emilio Ferrara was a postdoc in our lab who, part of this team, he got a low score. And then this was a bot um, which was created by students in a class whose homework assignment, uh, project assignment for the class was to design bots and get them, their grade would depend on how many followers they could get. So this was one of the ones that got the top grades because they just call it Justin Bieber photos and would automatically post Justin Bieber uh, pictures. And at that time, Justin Bieber was the number one celebrity on Twitter. So it was easy to get a lot of, rack up a lot of followers. Um, so, <clears throat> this tool uses over 1,000 features. Uh, they describe network structure, they describe user metadata, for example, how long is the name, when was the account created, and so on. Um, social, uh, social features, for example, statistics about an account's friends and followers. Uh, temporal information, for example, you could imagine that if uh, an account posts exactly every five minutes, right, it looks very automated, whereas human activity tends to be more bursty. Or if an account posts very high volume, then also that's suspicious. So different features related to that. We also looked at some content, for example, part of speech analysis, um, entropy of the words used, and, and also some sentiment analysis. And initially, this uh, tool was trained uh, using uh, some data that was collected by a colleague at um, Texas A&M a a a a University. And the bots that, were, um, that had been labeled by this particular, in this data set, tended to be pretty sim simplistic. They tended to be bots that basically sp posted spam and followed random people. A machine learning algorithm is only as good as its training set. So our classifier also was kind of limited. And we tended to be able to detect bots that tended to retweet a lot or uh, that were created recently, had a, a small account age or um, uh, you know, long usernames, these kinds of things. But uh, this was a few years ago and it uh, got a lot of attention in, in the press, so we were pleased with that. And what we learned from this project, um, um, uh, we then tried to apply to more difficult tasks. And one of these was a challenge um, by DARPA, which is a, a funding agency uh, in the US. And uh, we were one of several teams. And uh, the task was to detect a small number of bots that were created by hand to affect opinions about uh, vaccines. This is a very hot area in which there's a lot of misinformation. These particular bots were actually benign. They were trying to spread uh, credible information about vaccines. Um, but nevertheless, they were bots. And so our task was to detect them, and we did pretty well. We were one of the top teams. And in the, uh, in the course of this experiment, we, of course, realized that we needed to do better because um, some, some bot strategies were too sophisticated for a tool to detect. So here's an example of a bot. Um, it has a fake image from Wikipedia. Um, and so unless we looked for that, um, you know, that, that would be hard to catch. It had a persuasive description. In this case, nurse, mother, grandmother, citizen, patriot, we see these things all the time in bots these days. Uh, but it also had some suspicious features. For example, in time, you can see that there was like uh, some, some point in time when this account became very, very, very active. So those are kind of things that we can catch. And also simple and repetitive uh, content is something that, that we can catch. But basically what we find is that there isn't a single definition of a bot. And there isn't a simple label or way to say these are bots and these are humans. In fact, there is a huge gray area. At one end, there are real humans like my student here. 
At the other hand, you have like pretty obvious uh, bots that are not very smart, but there is a lot of stuff in the middle, like the nurse, fake nurse that I mentioned. And then there is these Android accounts. They, the content they, they produce is generated by humans, but a human will control a very large number of these accounts. And so the way that all of these accounts are posting the same content is through software. So we think of them as bots, or at least automated, even though the content itself is generated completely by humans. And that's a very, very common type of bot. Um, and so from the content, you wouldn't be able to say, because it is posted at times that are human. The content is created by humans. It is, you can only notice this kind of pattern when you look at many of them and realize that they're all doing the same thing. So we um, collected, uh, well, actually, um, Onur Varol, the student, uh, uh, tried to improve the uh, capability of the algorithm to detect these more sophisticated bots by, um, by uh, training with, you know, by adding to the data set some more sophisticated examples of bots. So in this case, for example, <clears throat> As, as opposed to the examples that I showed earlier, in the middle you have an account, POTUS. This is not the account that uh, Trump uses all the time. This is the official account. And um, uh, generally, the president does not use that account to tweet. The, the content produced in that account is done by his staff. And so there is a large number of people, a team, that together very carefully crafts the messages. And so that sometimes is confused by machine learning algorithms like ours for a bot. Because it's not human in the sense that it doesn't look like the content of common people. It's very curated. But it is not a bot. It's just an organization. So that's an additional challenge. It's a different dimension. Anyway, uh, uh, what I was saying is that we, um, we try to improve the training by adding more sophisticated bots. And you can sort of. Um, mix the training set with, uh, with more or less sophisticated bots uh, to come with more um, conservative or, or, or more aggressive estimates of the number of bots that are out there. So we did that, and to, we tried to have an estimate of the, of the bot population. So, um, so for example, if you assume that most bots are simplistic, then you get a, an estimate of a smaller number, roughly 9% of all accounts. If you assume that bots can be much more sophisticated, then you get a, a more aggressive estimate, like 15% on the right. Uh, so that was our kind of estimate, somewhere between 9 and, and 15%. So for example, you might make a very reasonable assumption, like, say, like this one here. And uh, by the way, for each mix, of course, we trained uh, the algorithm in order to minimize the number of uh, errors, false positive and false negative, and we set the threshold that way. And that's how we then transform the score into a, a binary classifier. And then we use that uh, with a large number of active accounts to get this estimate of the big number. So in this case, you would say 13%. So 13% of roughly 320 million accounts, active accounts, is 42 million. So 42 is the answer. <laughs> the question is, how many million bots are there on Twitter? Um, and, but unfortunately, the press focused on the higher number, the 15%. So the next day, we had all these articles saying that there's 46 million accounts, or 48, sorry, 48 million accounts. That's 15%. And, um, the reason I show all of these is because the reason that this particular result got a lot of attention is because it kind of resonated with people who are critical of Twitter. Because we all know that there are a lot of bots on Twitter. And so Twitter got a lot of bad press because of, of this finding. And actually, that was not our intention. Because honestly, we don't think that Twitter is particularly worse than other platforms. Um, the difference is that Twitter makes its data available so that researchers like us can do this kind of research. And so they also get negative press when we find that there are bots. But I would imagine that there are an equal amount of bots also on other platforms. Um, recently, there has been some press about WhatsApp. That stuff we can't even see because the data is not only it's, it's not available to anybody, it's, right? it's encrypted and then deleted and so on. Um, uh, Facebook, uh, 
in theory, is usually often mentioned that because they have a policy that enforces identities, unique identities for user, then according to that, it would have fewer bots. But don't forget that Facebook has pages. And Facebook pages are just like Twitter accounts. Anybody can create a page about anything, say that it's about anyone, and there's no way to check who's behind that page. And in fact, if you follow the news, you know that many of these pages were created recently by Russian tr uh, trolls from, from the internet research whatever group uh, in St. Petersburg, and they were used to influence opinions, just like bots on Twitter. So um, my guess, I, I, so please don't take away from this that Twitter is bad. I think Twitter is a target of abuse, just like all platforms. Anyway, given the interest and increasing number of people wanting to uh, use this kind of tool, we rebranded it, we called it Botometer, we made it widely accessible so that there is a really nice interface that you can now use. Uh, you can check all of your followers, you can check your friends, you can just check any particular account, and you can also access it programmatically. So there is a free and open API that anybody can use. And Botometer is one of a set of tools that we make available as part of a platform that we called Observatory on Social Media, or in short, Awesome, <laughs> because it's awesome. And here's some of the tools that we have. I mentioned Botometer. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Hoxie later. Uh, other tools are used to visualize uh, animations of uh, diffusion networks. Um, so that you can sort of appreciate some of these patterns by yourself, and also looking at timelines, uh, for example, for hashtags or geographic spreading patterns, um, and also networks of, of diffusion. So here's an example. You uh, can input a hashtag, like in this case, Ice Bucket Challenge, which, as you remember, was a very viral hashtag a few years ago. And you can put a, a beginning and end date and then do a visualization of the main cores of the network that were spreading these, um, these hashtags. So that you can look at, for example, who are the most influential accounts, like here's G uh, something that was influenced by Jimmy Fallon and um, Katy Perry up there, and then how the different clusters are um, generated by when an account migrates from one community to, to, sorry, when a meme migrates from one community to another. So we like to study the role of communities in, in this spread. But one interesting thing that you can do is you can combine this kind of visualization of the network to understand the structural features of the diffusion with knowledge about the bots to try and ask what is the role that bots play when we look at something that is spreading virally. So it turns out that we have free APIs for Awesome and for Botometer. So you can basically submit a query like, in this case, SB277 and a period of time and, and get the tweets that mention this hashtag. Now, this hashtag, for those of you who don't know, um, refers to a proposed bill in California about uh, vaccinations, children vaccination. Um, because of misinformation about vaccines and successful anti-vaccination campaigns, increasing numbers of parents were not vaccinating their children and we had lots of outbreaks, including the famous one in Disneyland, you may remember a few years ago, of uh, preventable diseases. Um, so there was this proposed law that would make it more difficult for parents to get an exemption. Parents can get an exemption just by saying, I don't want my child vaccinated. And this law said, well, if you have a good reason, that's fine. Like, for example, if your child has a known allergy or, or, um, or you know, bona fide religious reasons or something like that. Otherwise, you should vaccinate your children. And this was enormously contentious because on one side, you had health experts that were trying to prevent these kind of outbreaks. At the other side, you had concerned parents who didn't know what, what they were reading was true or not. They were bombarded with information that was telling them that these vaccines would kill their children. And so they were worried and they said, well, I'm the parent and you shouldn't, the state shouldn't tell me whether or not to vaccinate my children. So there was a lot of debate around this. And so we looked at this network of people talking about this hashtag. And again, here, the size of the node is the influence of an account. So how many times that account is retweeted. And the color is the bot score. And so what you observe here is that you have several very influential accounts that are most likely bots. Okay? So this means that in this particular case, someone who had an interest, and there are very strong financial 
interests here, the people who are spreading the misinformation about vaccines, they make money by giving speeches and by endorsing basically snake oil uh, treatments. Uh, and, and so they have a financial incentive for this kind of manipulation. And we see that it works. So that's worrisome. And then we did the same analysis in some other cases. For example, there was talk about bots influencing the Brexit uh, discussions. And this is the Brexit uh, diffusion network. And here, too, we saw some nodes that were highly influential and highly likely bots. And we also saw it in the campaigns, both of them, more on one side than the other. Um, so we wanted to make this kind of visualization um, uh, more easily accessible. We, we, we want to allow people to study how misinformation is spreading online. So we built a tool called Hoaxy. Um, it kind of works like a search engine initially. So you submit a query. So here the query is 3 million votes illegal aliens. And what you get is uh, articles that are in our search engine that match that query. We crawl a lot of fact-checking websites and also a lot of fake news and various misinformation websites. And so these are hits. You can see the first hit here, three million report, three million votes in presidential election cast by illegal aliens. That was an article that appeared in InfoWars. I already mentioned InfoWars. It was very uh, influential. It was, retweeted, uh, it was reshared 52,000 times on Facebook. And um, in our database, it was in 18,000 tweets. This was uh, posted um, just a few days before the president made the statement that he had read somewhere that there were 3 million illegal votes. <laughs> and um, that th that's why he lost the popular vote. We could not find any other source of that information other than that one article. And then uh, here you see an article from PolitiFact that debunks that, which was posted later when this was uh, spreading virally. And many others, because then, of course, because this was a very popular meme, it got mutated. And so there were many, many, many uh, copies of this, like one million, two millions, one million in California, and all sorts of variations. So uh, the way it works is that you can then select a few of these, like like these ones with the check boxes here. And then you can visualize the network. So here, this is an animation, because the website does allow you to, well, actually, this is a new feature that's not there, but it will be released soon. So you can look at, over time, how this network uh, sort of, uh, uh, how, how this meme uh, spreads out. You can see a timeline here of the fact checking and the fake news. You could see which were the most influential accounts in the early stages. But you can also, and you can see how the people who are sharing the fact checking are kind of separate. They're not that closely connected to the central core of the people who are sharing and being exposed to misinformation. And then you can see that there was a big spike later on, which was connected to this particular account. So this particular account was very influential, but only in this second wave, okay? And it turns out that that's a bot. Um, most likely a bot. Uh, that's a high bot score. Um, and so you can click on a node and look at its bot score. Uh, the data comes from Botometer. You can update it. You can see for each account who they retweeted and which links they shared and so on. So it allows us to begin to study these networks of diffusion of misinformation. So we try to do this a little bit more systematically. We took a bunch of, we took a period of time around the elections and we looked at about 400,000 claims. These are um, links to uh, articles from websites that routinely publish fake news, conspiracy theories, and, and uh, clickbait, and so on. And, um, and there were about 13.6 million of tweets with that shared these uh, links, these 400,000 uh, articles. And then we also looked at roughly 15,000 articles during the same time that were shared uh, and that came from fact-checking websites. And those were shared in about a million tweets. Now, most, most articles 
On average, these articles are not very, very popular. They might get like 30 to 50 retweets. But of course, the distribution is very broad, and some of them are extremely popular. So let me show you first the structure of the big network, like the one that you get from putting together all of these fake news. I, I, I'm using fake news here as a very generic umbrella term to mean misleading news, uh, conspiracy clickbait, out of context or manipulated photos, uh, all kinds of misinformation. And here, <clears throat> an orange edge represents the resharing of a fact-checking article, and a blue edge represents the resharing of a fake news article. And so the first thing that you notice is that these two communities don't really talk to each other, right? So there's a lot of debate. How can we make fact-checking more effective? And, and um, I'm sort of uh, often talk to people who sort of try to make fact-checking more effective, and we think that that's an important problem. But you can make it all effective if you, uh, that you want, but if nobody reads, if the people who read the fact-checking are the people who already were skeptical of the misinformation, it's not going to be very helpful. And the fact here is that there is a very large, very large number of people who um, they consume this misinformation and never question it. So this is, by the way, this is not the entire network because, again, I couldn't visualize it. This is, um, for those of you who know about networks, this is a K-core decomposition, and it is the core with degree at least five. So we excluded a lot of nodes at the periphery to focus on the core, and there are 52,000 nodes here in this particular visualization. Now, for each account, we computed two things. First one is, how likely are there to share articles from fake news versus articles from fact-checking. And that's on the y-axis here. So, so if it's towards one, means these are people who are mostly sharing fact-checking. Whereas down here towards zero, they're mostly sharing fake news. And then we also looked at how are they sharing things? Are these people sharing original tweets or are they just retweeting? So are they amplifiers or are they original generators of the information? Okay, so high number here means um, that they have IE in strength for networks people, which means that they are um, retweeting, okay? So here would be people who are posting original tweets. And you can see that people sort, most people are at the extremes. There are not a lot of people in the middle. People usually are mostly retweeting or mostly posting original tweets, and either they post almost exclusively fake news or almost exclusively uh, fact-checking. Now, as we move towards the core of the network, so we remove more of the periphery, and we focus on the most dense central core of the network, uh, these two uh, clusters become more separated. Um, actually, <clears throat> if you look at uh, the percentage of fact-checking activity, interestingly, it goes down very abruptly when we get to the core where each node has at least degree 20. So at some point, which is not yet here, this is k equal 15. Um, but at some point, basically, there is a separation, and fact-checking basically disappears. And so in this picture, you can see it. So here, uh, every node has degree at least 25. There is a handful of fact-checking web uh, articles, uh, um, uh, people who, a handful of people who tweet fact-checking articles. Uh, that get spread, but, uh, but very little activity. And in fact, you see that in that matrix there, there's nothing at the top right, okay? So there is no people who retweet uh, fact-checking. There are some people who tweet fact-checking, okay? And you can see that that's uh, people up in the top left corner. And that's what these orange edges are. So there's some people who usually just tweet or retweet fake news who occasionally will tweet a link to a fact-checking site. And this is uh, the innermost core. Uh, every node has at least degree 50. So the only two accounts that have remained who post regularly fact-checking websites are Snopes and PolitiFact, which are the two most popular fact-checkers in the United States. So, by the way, Real Alex Jones and Prison Planet are both associated with Infowars. And as you can see here, the picture is even clearer. There is basically nothing left up there. So this is the core of people 
and it's still, you know, there are about 700 nodes here. These are, these are accounts that are very, very, very active. They are at the center. They're spreading all this misinformation. Occasionally, they share a fact checking. So we looked at what is that? And in fact, we found that there's basically two kinds of things that these people share. One is attacks on the fact checkers. They may have a link to PolitiFact or Snopes and say, this is a politically communist website, poli extremist, and they are completely partisan. So they basically are attacking the fact checkers. Or they're doing things like these. Hillary Rodham Clinton praised her KKK friend and mentor, Bird. She's a racist. Uh, she was kissed by a former Klan member. And then a link to Snopes. So you're thinking, I, I read this, and I thought, ha ha. See, even Snopes says that Clinton has Ku Klux Klan friends. If you actually click on that Snopes link, it says, no, no, this is completely fabricated. It's false. But few people do that. So this is a trick. In fact, the statement made here is the exact opposite of what the link says. Same thing here. Uh, 13 hours of hell in Benghazi, no help was sent. Her emails show that she knew the truth. Link, PolitiFact. If you actually click on that link, it says there is absolutely no evidence this is fabricated. But people who are likely to believe this, which are people on this side, they're not going to click. They're just going to say, ha ha, I knew it. Even the fact checkers say it. Imagine. So that's an interesting um, sort of observation about this core of misinformation. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that um, there is a broad diversity in the popularity of this misinformation, their success. Okay, so here we see uh, on the x-axis two measures of success, number of tweets that share a particular article, number of users who share a particular article. These are all, uh, the, and you can see the comparison between fake news and fact checking. They're basically indistinguishable. They're both very broad distributions. And these are the typical classic things that we observe in, in social networks, where most things are not very popular, but a few things are exceedingly popular. So this is a log scale, like um, we've seen earlier today. So you know what that is. And so we can see here articles that are shared by like 10,000 people or in, or in tens of thousands of tweets. And the example that we sh saw earlier, the one about the witchcraft, would be an example towards the tail, one of the most popular ones. So I want to go back to the idea of bots. What is the role of bots? Can we quantify the role of bots? So let me just show you a few quick uh, findings. On the top left, this is a plot that shows the number of times that one account shares the same link, one and the same link. OK, the distribution of time. So most of the times, if you share something, you share it once, right? Humans do that. But we find that some accounts share the same link like 1,000 times or more. And so those are suspicious, right? I mean, we, most humans, we, we wouldn't do that. We also see that if we focus on the most active uh, accounts, they have a distribution of bot scores that is significantly different, statistically different, from the distribution of all the accounts, even, and we're talking here about people who share misinformation, not generic account, but just the ones that are not necessarily the most active, a random sample of the whole set. So this suggests that these hyperactive bots, these super spreaders, are probably bots. Another interesting thing that we observe uh, on the top right is that the more viral a um, uh, the, most, the, most viral, the more viral an article is, which is something on, that we show on the x-axis, the more the tweets for that article are, originate from a small number of accounts. Okay? And that's measured with something called the Gini coefficient. We don't have to worry about the technical details. But the point is, like, this is something that is large if, um, if, if there's a lot of concentration. A lot of activity is just concentrated in a few accounts. And it's a small number if like, a lot of different people are sharing. So, uh, so as we move to the most popular, the most viral tweets, uh, they become more and more concentrated. And we also observe that as we move towards the core, 
like the analysis that I showed you earlier, the average bot score of accounts grows steadily. So this, this score is made more and more of, um, uh, more, uh, as more populated with bots. So these bots are in the core, they're super spreaders. What strategies do they use? Okay, so this is an interesting one at the top. Um, we looked at um, whenever something is shared, as a function of the uh, lag time, time after the first tweet, we look at all the accounts that have shared it in that first interval, and we look at the average, uh, the distribution of the bot scores for those accounts. And what we find is that if you look at the first 10 seconds, you get sort of a high uh, average bot score. The, the dash is the median, high median, and, and the distribution is high. And then after that, it kind of like goes down. So this suggests that the bots are acting very early. Okay, so, well, it makes sense if you think about it. If you want to spread something, you have bots that just automatically retweet whatever you post. And so most likely these accounts are the ones who are working together with those who publish the fake news. Or at least they are coordinated. Another thing that we looked at, we noticed that people, uh, remember earlier when I showed you the example of that botnet that uh, mentioned some influential user? We noticed that as well here, so we wanted to quantify that effect. So we looked at all the, um, um, all the accounts that mention another account with a link to a fake news article. And uh, um, the more the accounts had a higher, the higher the bot score of those mentioning accounts, the more followers the mentioned people have. So in other words, bots tend to mention very popular influential people. And that's kind of reasonable. And in fact, we see this a lot. So what they do, in fact, usually, is that they reply. So Trump will post something, and then you will see an army of 100 accounts who reply to that message with links to fake news, just to try to get this influential person to read it and believe it or share it. Are bots effective? Um, so to answer that question, we looked at retweets. Uh, Almost finished. Uh, we looked at retweets, okay? So when an account is retweeting another account, we can look at the bot score of the account that is being retweeted and the account that is doing the retweeting. And so this uh, density plot here shows a map of those two scores. It's a joint distribution. And so what it, um, what it shows is that if you look at the top, that's a projection on the bot score of the retweeter and it shows that most of the retweeting is done by accounts with low bot score, so more likely humans, okay? So most of the retweeting is actually done by humans. Now, if you focus on the humans, the ones who have a low bot score in this shaded area here, who do they retweet? What is the distribution of the score of the accounts that are being retweeted? And what you see is that curve here, and that shows that that has both humans and bots. So humans retweet, as much bots as much as they retweet humans. So that means that, he, that bots are effective at uh, camouflaging and being retweeted by, by humans. Another thing that we observe is that the websites that share misinformation are heavily supported by bots. So here we have the total volume, so the, the circles in red are the fake, uh, fake news websites, the ones in orange are satire, and the ones in light blue are fact-checking websites. And on the x-axis, you have a measure of uh, how popular they are, like the total tweet volume. And the size of the circle is the median uh, volume, uh, because, of course, there is a lot of uh, variance. And then on the y-axis, you have the uh, average bot score of the active accounts that retweet these websites. And you can see that the, the fake news websites are tweeted by uh, accounts with higher bot numbers. And some of them are extremely popular. And some of them are supposed, supported by bots a lot, like that circle at the top. Um, last point is um, what could we do to disrupt this network? Like, imagine that we were the platform. What, what kind of strategy should we develop? Well, 
Um, so this is a standard network robustness analysis. What you do is you rank accounts by some criterion, and then you imagine what would happen if I remove that account. For example, if I was Twitter, if I was suspending or maybe um, de-emphasizing their tweets or whatever. And how much of the tweets with misinformation would decrease? Uh, this is how many uh, posts would remain, and this is how many unique links to articles would remain. So the best thing that you can do is this curve down here that says retweet the accounts that are most retweeted. That makes sense, right? Retweet those super, super influential nodes, um, you know, like Alex Jones and whatever. So if you, if you sort of de-emphasize those, then of course a lot of the stuff would go away. That's very hard to do for a platform because you know, this would be censorship in some sense. Um, and so that's, uh, that's something where that platforms rightly struggle. And even, even we would have very strong ethical questions about, about doing that, right? Um, but if you look at, if you simply rank accounts by their bot score, um, and then you sort of see what happens if you um, uh, eliminate those, it turns out that, uh, and that's this curve here, it turns out that it would do just as well if you remove roughly 10%. And remember, that was our estimate of roughly what percentage of accounts are bots, or close to it. So this suggests that if we were able to uh, effectively recognize and detect social bots that, viol that violate terms of service on platforms, and platforms were able to detect them and suspend them, which is a difficult problem, uh, then we could do a lot to sort of alleviate, to mitigate the issue, the problem of fake news. All right, so that was my last uh, slide. Let me just summarize what we've seen. First, uh, network temporal content, user features can be used to detect different kinds of abuse like AstroTurf, social bots, and also coordinated campaigns, something that I didn't have time to show you. Uh, bots are getting smarter and they are effective at spreading misinformation. Uh, and tools to detect this kind of manipulation of public opinion may be important first steps towards a trustworthy web. And I'll also thank uh, many collaborators involved in this research, uh, especially many students and, and postdocs and funding agencies. And thank you guys. Hi, thanks for the great presentation. Thank you. Um, in terms of learning the features of bots, on the last slide especially you mentioned that bots adapt quickly. And I would assume this is similar to search engine optimization, yeah? So these algorithms detect. It's an arms race. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So um, what implication has that on a machine learning problem? Because in, in the end you need to retrain your models uh, quickly. And do you have any any... Any answers, any indications to that? Uh, I don't have a satisfactory answer. <laughs> you are right. Uh, behaviors change, and it's an arms race. If uh, we develop an effective detection tool, then probably some bot makers are going to develop some bots that are going to evade that uh, tool. And this is normal. This is what happens in these kinds of adversarial problems. And we've seen it in other domains. Um, so when uh, the reason I'm optimist is that I think back of the case of email spam. Uh, several years ago, those of you who are a little bit older remember that email became almost unusable at some point as a communication medium because of spam. But then at some point, slowly uh, we, we developed better and better spam detection tools and until they were good enough that spam still exists. In fact, it exists in huge volume and it still does some harm so phishing attacks, uh, uh, identity theft, and so on. These things still happen, fraud. But it is expensive or difficult enough to build a successful campaign that um, the damage of it is mitigated. To the point, not to the point that we have solved the problem, but to the point that the medium is usable. And spam is not our major concern anymore. And so. I'm optimistic that if we keep building better tools, we're, we, and uh, eventually we'll increase the cost or the difficulty of developing effective deception uh, strategies to the point that they will still exist, 
but hopefully they will not be as widespread and they will not have the kind of huge consequences that we're observing these days. And at the same time, people are becoming more aware of it. And so hopefully the outcome of that will not people say, okay, let's stop using the medium because you disagree with me, so you're a bot. Let's hope that we don't go there. But instead, uh, people become more aware that they can be manipulated, that they can be vulnerable, and so they became, become more careful about what they share, and they start using tools more aggressively to be sure that they use the media to communicate with other people and not to be manipulated. So we're not there yet. It'll probably take several years, uh, even optimistically, to get to that point, but I'm hopeful that at some point we'll get there. But that means that we need to keep building better, better tools, retrain them constantly, uh, find better examples to train them, and so on. Okay, further. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this fascinating, if frightening story. Um, one of my original trainings is as a, in communication sciences. And there is a very old um, theory there. It's called news value theory. And news value has I think about 12 factors. Um, and I think that those viral and retweeted stuff actually has a very high news value. So it's, it's exaggerated, it's bad, it talks about important nations, important people, etc. And I think that you cannot make up for that in, in terms that if bots create news value, mm -hmm. they work into what the media system is about. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be hard even with a lot of artificial intelligence training yes. of your detections because people like that kind yes. of stuff. And that's what they're used in mass media. Very true, very good point. Um, this is one of the reasons why this problem is not the same as um, past uses of propaganda, because one common observation is like, propaganda has always existed, misinformation has always existed, which is absolutely true. What is different now is that platforms, in my opinion, make it easier to manipulate public opinion, because, for example, they make it possible for somebody who's generating fake news to generate things that people want, and that's exactly what you're talking about. So if everybody's talking about, I don't know, whatever, the tennis championship, then I have a captive audience, and I can talk about that and in, in, put some misinformation. That's not the only reason. They also make it easy to monetize. So I can create traffic and then make money through ads. So they create financial incentives. Uh, another thing is that because of the structure of the networks, uh, it's more easy to target people because you can find a community of people who are likely to be interested in that message. If you're pro, Candidate X, then you can create a fake message pro X and you have a ready community to digest that or anti Y, same thing. So the fact that these social networks are naturally clustered into homogeneous communities, what we refer to as echo chambers, makes it easy to target. It also makes it easy for people to be misled because they are, this is exposure bias, right? They don't see a good representation of the information space, they see a biased view. They see people who have similar ideas to them. And so they, it is harder for them to recognize that something is false because there isn't a voice that will say, hey, that's not true. Most of their friends believe it. And then one more reason is that um, both people and algorithm can be deceived uh, using bots because bots can create the appearance that a topic or an idea of a person is very popular. And we generally tend to pay more attention to things that we perceive as popular. This is very natural. It's one of the heuristics that we use to uh, allocate attention. When we have too many things to pay attention to, we naturally focus on the things that we think are important because everybody else thinks that they are important. So people are deceived and algorithms as well because algorithms used by, social, by search engines and social media tend to prioritize messages that people see on their news feed based on predicted engagement, which is basically to say estimated popularity. And so if you can create a lot of bots that create the appearance that something is very popular, then the algorithm will pick that up and make sure that everybody sees it. 
So these are all factors that make us more vulnerable to fake news because we rely so much on social media than we were when we rely, were relying on traditional media, which is not to say that traditional media were perfect, but they didn't have this particular set of vulnerabilities.